If the presentation is equal to all of you, can anyone confirm? Yes, sir. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with the Shanti Mantra and then begin with the class. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamidachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamiva Avashishate Om Shanti Shanti Okay, thank you for uh, attending today's class. So in today's class, uh, we will be covering uh, uh, the topic on lane arrays. So in the arrays, we have already covered how to analyze two element array. We have seen how to analyze n element array, correct? Not just from uh, mathematical analysis, but we have also seen how to analyze it in CST material studio also which is more powerful and there are two methods of analysis one using array tool and the other using the actual uh, physical simulation of the elements in today's lecture we'll be looking at uniform n element planar arrays that is two dimensional arrays so we'll mainly rectangular planar array is what we'll be looking at and we'll have follow the same procedure so we will what we'll do is we'll study the uh, analytical methods followed by CST simulation of the same and we will have a cross check of one to one how each one of it one of it uh, will be helpful in our analysis. So why do we study plane arrays? See uh, linear arrays or one dimensional array that is all the elements placed along z axis, x axis or y axis, any one of those axis or any other general axis can scan the beam only in one plane as we have already seen in the linear array so if the elements are placed along the z-axis, so the beam could be scanned only from theta equal to 0 n to 5 to theta equal to 90 degree plot set, correct? So it could be only uh, theta varying, the theta variation, but phi was the symmetric. So the uh, pattern along the phi axis was symmetric, along the phi axis was symmetric, whereas the scanning was possible only with theta. Whereas, if we want in applications uh, to scan the beam in any direction, so we want a pencil beam and that beam should be scanned in any direction, theta and phi, then we have to go for two dimensional arrays. So, predominantly planar arrays, rectangular planar arrays, or any other surfaces, we will see like uh, uh, elliptical surfaces or uh, 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 centric surfaces or circular surfaces also will be used. But we will be analyzing rectangular plane order. So this is one such example of a planar array used in airport warning and control system. Uh, it's this, so this entire array will be placed in an uh, aircraft. And uh, just from the figure, I don't know whether it is a patch antenna or the started rectangular railway antenna. But I know that feed is rectangular railway. You see the feed, correct? So the feed is rectangular waveguide. So I don't know whether it is patch antenna or the started waveguide antenna. Uh, anybody can figure out what it is from your experience with such antennas? Uh, sir, it is a patch antenna, sir. Sorry, can you, your voice is not audible. Uh, sir, it is a patch antenna that is uh, fitted in the nose of an aircraft. It's miniature version. It's a patch okay. antenna. Okay, so this is the patch antenna. So this is the patch antenna. So there are a huge number of elements you see, but it is fed with waveguide, correct? If I am right, it is fed with waveguide, correct? Uh, yes, sir. So it is fitted with the waveguide at the back of it, sir. And uh, it is uh, also has a redundancy, sir. The more details of it, I will cover in my seminar topics. Okay, that would be great. So it will be very wonderful. It will be wonderful actually. So I'll be looking forward to the seminar topic on this particular aspect. So uh, this is the patch antenna, and this is fitted in an aircraft nose of the aircraft, and it is uh, fed by the wavelet. So we'll have more uh, understanding in the seminar topic. I'm really excited about this seminar. So nice. So. What is the geometry? So the geometry for the linear array we have already covered, right? So what we analyzed was we placed elements along the z-axis, not necessarily along the z-axis. It can be placed along the x-axis or it can be placed along the y-axis. 
So the way we analyze the planar array, rectangular planar array is as such. So first we place the elements along the x-axis. Okay. So this itself becomes a linear array, correct? It is a linear array with elements placing dx between the two elements. And this is geometry theta phi and tan. Now we place such linear arrays itself is treated as one antenna element and such antenna elements are placed along the y-axis. So we get a planar array, correct? So this is how, so it basically it's a, a linear array of a linear array. So that's what the, uh, the way our analysis will progress. So first of all, there is a linear array in the x-axis. So consisting of n elements. And if you treat this itself as a single antenna element and place such antenna elements along the y-axis, which is facing dy, then we get a planar array. So it's a linear array of a linear array. So then we get a planar array. The dx is the element spacing between the two elements in the x-axis. dy is the element spacing between the two elements in the y-axis. And r theta phi is the geometry, uh, the spherical coordinate system. So it's remember it's a linear array of a linear array. So that's how the entire analysis will progress. And we know how to analyze the linear arrays, correct? So the analysis will not be very complicated. So we know how what is the normalized array factor of the linear array of n elements placed along. So this is a general form of n elements placed along the uh, z-axis we have seen, correct? So this is either it can be expressed in terms of summation series or in the sinusoidal expression. Where phi is equal to kd cos theta plus beta. Remember, this was placed along the z-axis. Now, the, what happens to the array factor if it is not placed along the z-axis? If it is placed along the x-axis or y-axis, there is this minute modification, a minor modification. You can work it out. So, if it is placed along the z-axis, so the uh, so array factor consists of this expression where psi is equal to kd cos theta plus beta. If it is placed along the x-axis, it is kd sin theta cos phi plus beta x. So basically the projection. So if you take the projection along the z-axis, it is cos theta, correct? If it is a projection along the x-axis, it is sin theta cos phi. Sin theta cos phi. And projection along the y-axis will be sin theta sin phi. So that's exactly what's the expression, how the expression changes. Uh, remember, beta x is the Progressive phase shift that will be provided between the two elements in, if the plane and the elements are placed on z-axis. Beta y will be the progressive phase shift between the two elements if the elements are placed on the x-axis. And beta y will be the progressive phase shift between the uh, elements when elements are placed on the y-axis. And uh, dx and dy and dz are the spacings of the elements between the x between when they are placed on x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. Okay, so now in the planar array, we, uh, we take this as a single linear element, linear array, based on the x-axis and m elements, correct? So what is the array factor? So the array factor for such a linear array would be m is equal to 1 to m, capital M, i is the current of each individual element, and the array, uh, uh, the phase constant. So the phase, so the phase term, so the phase term consists of kd, uh, k d x sin theta cos by beta x as we have seen from the, from the x axis placement. Now such array such is such an array is treated as a single element of an antenna and such elements are placed along the y axis correct. So we have one more linear array now. So we have one more linear array with uh, element placing as d phi and progressive phase as beta phi sin theta sin phi where the constant so there is so this entire element of the previous array factor is treated as a single element uh, pattern so that the, that becomes a single element uh, the pattern of the previous linear array becomes the pattern of a single element so that's a common factor for the summation so this is the overall array factor for the planar array okay so we treat the planar array as a linear array of a linear array okay so how do we simplify this expression the simplification is uh, very straightforward. So you expand the array factor for the x array in this in this uh, summation, which is this summation. So you expand it. So if we get uh, this uh, two summation series of one in the x-axis and one in the y-axis. One place along the x-axis, one place along y-axis. 
array factor of the x axis is this blue term indicated in the blue term. And now for the uniform plane array, the, all the magnitude of the currents is constant, correct? So I can be taken outside. I m1 and I m2, they are all same as I i naught, which can be taken outside the summation series. So you take the currents outside the summation series. So it's in the constant, so it's taken outside the summation series. And since they are almost orthogonal to each other, they are orthogonal to each other, x and y axis are orthogonal to each other. Uh, you can actually write the summation of the summation series as product of two summation series. So the summation of the uh, array element array along the x axis and the array along y axis as if they are uh, independent uh, linear arrays along the x axis and the y axis. So you can write that because they are orthogonal to each other. So then it's very simple because we have already seen the array factor for the each individual summation. We, have, we know that how to express that in sign and write. We have already covered that in the linear arrays. We know how to get the signs or the definition from the summation series. So same thing happens. So you write the equation for the uh, array in the x-axis and the array along the y-axis as the sign sort of the expression. Normalize array factor 1 by m. Remember, m is the number of elements in the x-axis. And uh, psi x, psi x is not now kd cos theta. It is because it is placed along the x-axis, it is kd sin theta cos phi plus beta x and similarly 1 by n sin phi the sin of uh, n by 2 uh, psi phi psi y and psi y is given by kd sin theta sin phi beta x, beta y so these will be the, the m is the number of elements in the x axis and n is the number of elements in the y axis so this is a, a normalized array factor for the Rectangular array. So this is uh, normally the effective for the array along linear array along the x-axis, along the x-axis, and this is the normal array factor for the uh, linear array along the y-axis, and the product of that will give us the array factor along the uh, for the plane array. So which are rectangular plane array. So let us see the pattern, how the pattern looks like. So now it's very straightforward, right? How to how do you plot the pattern? So basically array factor. Oh, I forgot to mention. When we are doing this analysis, we are not taking the element factor into account. Please remember that. As of now, whatever the array factor we have calculated is applicable only for isotropic sources placed along the array geometry. So element factor has not been taken into account as of now. This has to be multiplied by the element factor to get the actual radiation pattern of the array. So very often we forget that and we then do an experiment and then we find out that it's not matching with the uh, expected result. So this is the pattern when the spacing is lambda by 4, both the spacings are same, dx is equal to dy, lambda by 4 is the spacing. They are all phase in, in phase fed, they are all fed in phase, beta x is equal to beta y is equal to 0, number of elements are 5, 5, n, n, n is equal to n is equal to 5. So these are the pattern looks like. And uh, this is a broad side pattern because you have the array placed along the xy in the xy plane and the radiation is a 90 degree to it. So this is a broad side pattern for the array, correct? So even though it is a theta equal to zero is the maximum, it's a broad side pattern for the array because the array is placed uh, in the xy plane and the direction of radiation is in the 90 degrees. And if you want to minimize the, the 3 degree beam width, you can increase the spacing up to lambda by 2. We have already seen that, correct? For the broad side case, we can go up to lambda by 2 without any gradient loops. But as soon as you increase, go to lambda, you start seeing the gradient loops. So you start seeing the gradient loops along the edges, periphery of the radiation pattern. So, uh, don't avoid lambda. You can go up to lambda by two for broad set arrays, and most probably plane arrays will be used in the broad set configuration. Uh, so you can go up to lambda by two for the plane arrays. Whereas for the N5 case, it was lambda by four. Okay, so for the linear array, N5 case, with for avoiding the gradient loops, you can go up to lambda by four. If you go lambda by two, there will be gradient loops. Okay. So what are the maxima? So the maxima is when uh, psi x and psi y are zero, same condition. So because the condition comes from here. So this when this entire term is one, 
and this entire term is one. So that will happen when zero by zero, zero by zero, and that will happen when sine phi x uh, phi x is equal to zero and psi y is equal to zero. So x and psi y is equal to zero. Okay. So that is the condition for maxima to occur. So whereas here it is not pretty cost theta, it is uh, the projections are different. So you have to take the projection into account. Beta x and beta y are the products of phase shift. So where is the first maxima occurs? So first maxima occurs when n is equal to n is equal to zero. So that's the first maxima, correct? And it can be in any direction we want. Theta is equal to theta naught, phi is equal to phi naught. So if you place uh, phi uh, psi x is equal to zero, you get the expression for beta x in terms of theta naught and phi naught. Remember, theta naught and phi naught are the maximum directions of maximum radiation. Once again, don't forget this is for array factor. It doesn't account the, for the element factor. So there can be a difference between the array factor and the actual simulation. Actual simulation. You will see that. You will see that in the best class itself. And phi y is uh, given by this, the beta y is given by this expression. So beta x and beta y are the approach of phase So this is what is required for us, correct? So we want to know what should be the uh, progressive phase shift such that the radiation is uh, in the direction that we want with theta and phi naught, theta naught and phi naught. So these two are very important expressions. So these expressions, from these expressions, we can determine what should be beta x and beta y for the maximum radiation to occur at theta naught and phi naught. So that is the main maxima that occurs at. So alternatively, suppose you already know beta x and beta y, you can calculate theta naught and phi naught using these expressions. You just uh, manipulate these two expressions to calculate theta naught, provided beta x and beta y and k dx and dy and dx are known. So you get the expression for uh, phi naught and theta naught. So you can get these expressions if you know already the product of x. If you want to know the progressive phase shift for a given radiation for a maximum for a uh, for the maximum to occur in the required direction, theta naught and phi naught, you can use these two expressions. Okay, so just as an example, if you take the dx and dy is equal to lambda by two, you can go up to lambda by two, correct? So for the broad shift case, you can go up to lambda by two. And beta x and beta y is equal to you express, you find out this m is equal to n. So from these two equations, you can find out beta x and beta y to have the maximum at theta is equal to 30 degrees and phi naught is equal to 45 degrees. So what you have to do is you have to basically plug theta naught here as 45 degrees and phi naught as 30 degrees and determine beta x. So the beta x turns out to be this value and the same with beta y also because the spacings are same. So since the spacings are same, so they both are same and the number of elements are also same. So you get a maximum radiation along the direction that you want, along the phi naught is equal to 45 degrees and theta naught is equal to 30 degrees. So how do we calculate the, the half power beam bits? Half power beam bits, so right now it's a conical, it's a more more like conical beam, correct? Directional beam. So for the directional beam, we have already seen, we want two principal planes. So we want the half power beam width in two principal planes. If you know the half power beam width in the two principal planes, then we can calculate the uh, directivity very easily, right? Using cross formula or the temporal asymptote. So for the half power beam width to be, so this we have already seen the condition for the maximum to occur, beta x and beta y. Uh, so what is the half power beam width along one of the principal planes, so theta h and psi h. So these are the two orthogonal planes, okay, along the maximum direction. So the half of the width is given by this expression, uh, where theta x and theta y are the half of the width of the broad side array for m elements and n elements, as if they are independent m elements and they are linear array and linear array of m elements, linear array of m elements. So you can, once you have, so you know uh, the linear array of m elements, how to find out the theta x, right? So we have already seen the half of the width for the broad side case, same five case, and we have seen uh, other cases also, ordinary n5 case, Hansen would be n5 case. So you go to the broad side expression and calculate the theta x naught for the linear array of m elements using the table. We have already seen that. Similarly, you calculate the theta by naught for the n elements. If m is equal to n, they both will be same, provided spacings are also same between them. In that, in such a case, and theta naught and phi naught is the direction where the maximum occurs. 
So then you get one of the half of the units along the one of the principal planes. So to get the other uh, half of the units along the other principal plane, you can find you can use this expression. So these two expressions will give you the half of the unit theta h and phi h along the principal plane. Along the principal planes. Okay, so once you know half of the units, you can calculate directly. So you can use the formula of what we have already seen. Uh, so you beam solid angle using beam solid angle or two half power units. So two multiplication of two of half power units is the beam solid angle, right? So you can use either class method or type class method to calculate the directivity. So the directivity is uh, sorry, beam solid angle is given by the multiplication of two. Half of the units around the two principal orthogonal planes. So, if once you know them, multiply them to get phi a and use this expression to get directivity. So, this is how we calculate the directivity for the rectangular planar array. Remember, all this analysis has two important simplifications. The first simplification is we have not considered the element analysis, element pattern into account. Element pattern was completely missing out of our analysis. So you have to multiply whatever you have got with the element pattern, and then I, what we find out that the maximum direction changes. You will see. So element pattern is very important to account for. So most of the analysis that we have done now is applicable only for isotropic planar arrays, and uh, there is a lot of limitations in that. The second uh, approximation we have already seen is that. Uh, in the geometry, you take all the elements. Uh, if this is observation point, okay. So the actual geometry would be to connect each individual element with observation point, correct? And then theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, and theta even we have to calculate. So that is wow. That's very tedious to perform the analysis. So what is the approximation we do? So if this is observation point, we write we draw parallel lines, correct? And then we make all theta the same. Theta is one, theta two, theta two is all same as theta. And phi one, phi two, phi two, everything is same as phi. So we write uh, the we we make parallel lines. So that is the second approximation that we make. So these two approximation actually limits our analysis, our analysis for the real field application. So we will see that we will see that in the uh, next part of the lecture. So, any clarifications on how to analyze? Uh, so, the, if you forget it, so the simplest way to remember this is the linear array of a linear array. So, this is a linear array analysis. So, the planar array is a linear array of the linear array. So, the array factor will be the product of the individual linear arrays. Whereas, don't forget the projection. It won't be KD cos theta. KD cos theta was uh, uh, the phase term when the elements were placed on the z axis. Whereas now, it will be a different projection. So, any so with that we terminate the uh, analysis of planar arrays in a very simple way, in a very simple terms, and uh, uh, not much complicated, very straightforward. Uh, any clarifications? I will take the CHT simulation also. So, any clarification before we go into the CHT? Okay, so let us take this simulation and uh, we will see how this all works out in the real actual application. Okay, let me open the CST. So I will be using the same patch antenna which we analyzed in the previous class. Before we go to the arrays, I will just increase the the frequency sweep and show you the spurious response of the patch antenna. Yeah, this is the patch antenna that is simulated, right? Yes, this was the complete DB at 4 gigahertz. Okay. <clears throat> So we need one more variable uh, which is array distance. So array distance, so I have already taken it. So array distance is how much at 4 gigahertz, lambda by 2. Lambda by 2 at 4 gigahertz. 
So at 4 gigahertz, so the wavelength is 75 mm. So 75 by 2. That's I have already taken the array distance as lambda by 2. So I have already taken that. And this is a patch antenna we simulated, right? So let me quickly increase the. Uh, there are two things to discuss before we go into the other factor. One is to show you the spurious response of the patch antenna and how to probably make it a dual band. So for that, uh, let me put the frequency. I will increase it from 3 to 5 just to, see, just to show you the spurious. Anybody remembers what are the spurious response for the simple PC monopole antenna? Lambda by 4 monopole antenna, what, where the spurious will occur at? It will be 3 times F0, correct? So the, for the monopole antenna, it will be 3 times F0. For the dipole antenna, it will be 2 times F0. We will see where the patch antenna will be exhibit. What will be the spurious for the patch antenna? And, uh, excuse me, sir? Yes, Hazam. Why did we change the frequency? Ah, because <laughs> why did we change from to, to 4 gigahertz, is it? Yes, sir. Uh, it was uh, the central frequency was 4 gigahertz and now we uh, modified. Correct. I didn't want the, I will be asking some uh, um, interim examination at uh, some other frequency. I don't want to repeat the same thing at that frequency. That's why. Okay, so let us um, see the school years. Well, it's good. Up to 5 gigahertz, it's good. Let us into it further. Two two eight. Let us check it up to two eight. I want to show the spurious signature of the patch antenna and possibly how to possibly shift the make it into dual band. Dual band will be a little bit tricky because you have to play with the position also, the field also. I will not be showing the picture now. I will just uh, tell you what possible changes you can use to make it dual band. Yeah, look at the signatures now. So if you remember in a PCB monopole antenna, the first overtone was occurring at three times F0, correct? Uh, and the dipole antenna would be two times F0. Whereas with the patch, you find out that the first overtone is much less than two times F0. So this is called the spurious free window. So from the required resonance frequency to the first overtone uh, is considered to be the spurious free window. And uh, this is the TM010 mode. This is from TM001 mode. This is TM020 mode. 
So by changing the W, you can play with this resonance. It is not very sharp because the feed has to mod be modified also. So probably by changing the W, you can play with this resonance and try to get a dual band antenna. So that is one way of probably getting dual band. But this, look at the spurious. It is spurious window is very small. So sometimes this comes very close to the resonance frequency also. You have to be a little bit careful with the spurious response in a patch antenna compared to a monopole antenna. Okay, so let us revert back the frequencies. Uh, what about the bandwidth? Sir? How can we improve it? Yes, one way to improve the bandwidth, what I know is uh, increasing the substrate thickness. Okay. So if you increase the substrate thickness, it will increase by another 1% or 1.5%. It's a minor improvement, not a major improvement. Significant improvement, I think one of the seminar will come. As I told in the last class, one of the students will be giving a seminar on using a parasitic. I just read the title. It says parasitic patch. On the using a parasitic patch, you can increase the bandwidth. I don't know how much percentage of bandwidth it will increase. So in the seminar, you will get to know. So that's what I mean. Anybody who is giving the seminar, can uh, can the student tell? I think it's Mahima, right? Yes, sir. So how much percentage of the bandwidth improvement can be obtained with patch to patch? Uh, sir, just a minute. Sir, with the parasitic, we get uh, the bandwidth uh, of approximately uh, 557.2 and without parasitic we get the bandwidth of 299 something so there is there will be an increment in the bandwidth by how much how much percentage 6.52 percent okay okay almost double you almost get a double the bandwidth you can make it double right yes sir Okay, okay. So that's what, but we will get into the seminar. So we'll look more details in the seminar of the, the seminar. Oh, I remember one more thing. I have created a files in the, I have created a project called files. I don't know how to, in the teams, under the files, I have created a folder called seminar PPT. Please upload your PPTs here in this uh, seminar PPT. Okay, I will just go through it before the seminar just to see if everything is okay or not. Please don't forget to upload the PPTs in, in the seminar PPT. Okay, so let us go back to our quickly uh, simulate this. Planar array. So we have to see different possibilities of a planar array in the patch antenna. Uh, we will be looking at both the aspects. How to uh, model the, uh, how to use the array factor which is a very quick tool correct and then how to use a full 3d simulation to to uh, make a complete array and then simulate that please give more importance to arrays so i think one of the problem for the inter examination will be on arrays uh planar patch and planar arrays to be very specific please have a practice of that Uh, please, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in the last uh, class, we simulated the batch antenna. Correct. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Now we are uh, changing the frequency, and uh, we added added a parameter array uh, distance. Uh, I think uh, you did multi uh, simulation. What's our M here, sir? Okay, so the reason why I changed the frequencies was to show you the different resonances that were coming. I showed you the resonance, correct? Yeah, uh, resonance, yeah, yeah. Yes, so there were uh, spurious resonances that were coming. Just to show you, the spurious free window will be significantly less compared to a PC monopole antenna. I increase the frequency, the range of simulation. And the array distance, I have added it array distance to use the planar array. To, I will show the planar array simulation. So for a planar array, we need array distance, right? So the distance between the two elements. So this is number by two. So I have taken it as a number by two to use it as a distance between the two elements in simulation. In the show it in the simulation. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. 
I'm just waiting for this uh, single element simulation to complete. Sir. Yes, please. So before the interim exam, will you be giving an assignment related to this patch array? No, Aradhana, I will not be giving the assignment. Uh, uh, we will be directly going with the interim. So I will suggest all of you to have a good practice of patch antenna, have a good practice of using the array tool, have a good practice of uh, doing the full simulation, full array simulation in the uh, CSTML cluster. So we'll be focusing, uh, we will not be focusing on more. Uh, Wire antenna or the monopole antenna. We have already covered that in the assignment and the midterm examination. So we'll be focusing only on the patch antenna. How uh, dipole antenna may come uh, in terms of array factor. So we will be focusing on the arrays and uh, the patch antenna. Uh, so in that case, uh, will you be showing us how we can actually feed the patch arrays? Feeding that. Yeah. No, feeding network, you don't have to do the feeding network. You will, you can, I will show how to use it in this today's simulation. I will show what you have to do it in today's simulation. You have to do only that much. You don't have to feed the, uh, you don't have to design feeding network. Okay, because feeding network itself is an uh, important topic. It is an important topic, uh, but I, we will not be able to cover it in this course. I will probably plan it for probably next term or something, but it's an important topic. It's a very good topic actually. Okay, so let us uh, use array factor. So we have completed the simulation. So in the simulation, we know how to see the far field pattern, correct? So this is the far field pattern for the individual. Uh, I have already enabled that. Right? Yes, so this is the far field pattern for the individual pattern, individual element. Now we can use array factor and let us try to replicate some of the examples that we have seen here. Okay, so for example, the first case we will be taking is we will be reducing the number of elements to n is equal to n is equal to 2 and in phase fed with uh, we directly go to lambda by 2. Okay, we have already taken the lambda by 2. So activate array, number of elements is 2, number of elements in y axis is 2, along y axis is 2, along x axis is 2. Spacing between the two elements is array distance and array distance. Phase shift is in phase fed, correct? So they are all in phase fed here. And you similar the pattern. So look at the gain. So now we have four elements. Yeah, what was the gain? That was around 8 dB, correct? So uh, theoretically, it should increase, uh, maximum it may increase is another 6 dB. But we are getting another 5 dB, 4 dB, approximately 4 dB of improvement in the gain. So these are 4 elements. So this is a 4 element, 4 cross 4 element. What happens if you increase the array distance to lambda, that is uh, 75, remember it, that is 75. So I have to enable it, disable it, okay, and then enable it. So what happens if we increase the distance to lambda? So in that case, we see the grating lobes coming in the picture, right? So this is the main lobe, and then there is a grating lobes now starts coming in all the four directions, exactly what is happening here. Now, one thing I would like to ask is, if you see the grating lobes here, they are all, almost at the same, magnitude peak compared compared to the here they are of size slightly lesser magnitude why why is it anybody wants to attempt array pattern right so the element pattern is now coming into the picture so the element here we assume it to be isotropic so isotropic because of isotropic nature, uh, so the array factor is so the uh, array pattern is only that of the array factor. So only because of the array factor. Whereas here the element is coming into the picture. So the element has a lesser radiation in these directions compared to the main radiation, and hence the grating load direct the grating load peak is also smaller compared to the array factor. Okay. So because of the element, so element factor. Okay, so this is regarding the broad set. So, okay, so we have seen regarding the broad set. You can you can play with the number of elements. So you can increase the number of elements also like 
you can have five elements and then you can play with the refactor so it becomes even more sharper right so being with look at the game game is very huge so this is one way to simulate the uh, array factor using uh, for the trainer arrays using the array factor tool. Uh, let us look at how to simulate this one. Uh, the one with so the first I have to disable that and then use lambda by two for the distance that I can quantify and then enable it. So let us exactly the same same example. Lambda by two we have taken, okay? And number of elements in the M and then is equal to five. So and beta is equal to this is how much is that in degrees? Minus one eighty by two root two by two root two. Sixty three point six four. Sixty three point six. So sixty three already. Okay, sixty three degrees. Minus 63 degrees and minus 63 degrees. Both are same, correct? Then beta x is equal to beta y is equal to 63 degrees. Update it. And let us see whether it yeah, expands, correct? See, this is phi. Look at the coordinate. So this is the phi axis and this is the theta axis. I have placed the array in the uh, element in the x, y plane. And look at what where the peak is maximum. At. How do we determine the maximum direction? You cannot determine the 3D plot. So you have to go with the uh, 2D plot. So in the 2D plot, you let us see, let us place these values and see. Uh, at phi, at theta is equal to 30 degrees. So at uh, theta is equal to 30 degrees. At theta is equal to 30 degrees. Let us see where the maximum is. Yes. At theta equal to 30 degrees, the main lobe, look at this here. So this is the 2D pattern. So that theta equal to 30 degrees. So the main lobe direction is at 45 degrees, which is exactly what we want. That is phi naught is 45 degrees, correct? Phi naught is 45 degrees. So that's the maximum. So phi is available here. Theta is fixed at 30 degrees and phi is varying. And when the phi is uh, 45 degrees, we get the maximum direction. The radiation of maximum direction is around 5 equal to. And look at the side lobe level. Side lobe level is 40 bit down. The maximum main lobe magnitude. Maximum main lobe magnitude is 18.60. Now let us go for phi is equal to 45 degrees and check what, whether it is maximum at 30 degrees. Whether it is maximum at theta equal to 30 degrees. Okay, look at the maximum main lobe direction. So the maximum main lobe direction is um, 30, around 27 degrees. Whereas uh, the maximum main, what was the maximum main lobe? 18.7, it is not very off, right? So 18.8, it is almost same there. So the maximum main lobe direction is not exactly 30 degrees. It is 27 degrees. So it's not exactly 30 degrees. So if you want exact 30 degrees, you have to play with the beta x and beta y. So you will have to play with uh, say minus 64, 65 and minus 65. It increased to 28. So if you want exactly, uh, maybe it is 70, I think. So it is exactly 30 degrees now. So you have the maximum main lobe around 30 degrees and the, uh, theta equal to 30 degrees and phi is equal to 45 degrees. And this is how you can uh, determine the maximum direction of radiation. Keeping theta phi is, uh, as 45 degrees, you will determine whether the maximum is occurring at 30 degrees for the theta. And keeping theta equals 30 degrees, determine if, I think it will change, I don't know, let's check. Oh, it's 45 degrees for the phi. So this is how you can determine. You can determine the 3D between width also and the side of level also. Okay, so this is one way to analyze the array factor. Now let us look at another way to analyze the array factor, which is let me 
reduce the number of uh, using the array factor let me disable that using the full array factor so how do we do the full array factor is i will just take two elements okay so you can go with uh, two elements that is here same as Then simulation project array task. So you can see the beauty here is you can analyze various possibilities. You can go for rectangular array or you can go for uh, octagon, you can go for circular arrays, which is very difficult to analyze. You know, it's very difficult to plane arrays was easy to analyze. Rectangular array was very easy to analyze, whereas circular array is very difficult to analyze. Ellipse array is more, even difficult to go for analytical method of. Analytical queue. So we will go for two element queue because it takes a lot of time for simulation. So I'll just show two element plus two element. Array distance is spacing. Come back to so this is how the array is will be. So create full array pad project. Okay. Yes, so analysis is like 4 gigahertz. Okay, so this is the, all the four arrays, the four elements are in place. So the center to center distance is 37.4, 37.5. And the ports have already been included. So you don't have to do the array filling. So you just have to include the ports. Already it is included in the ports, you don't have to do it. So just to know which element is what. So this is element one, this is element two, and this is element uh, three here and element four. So first let us combine with the broadside case. So for the broadside case, uh, so what was the broadside case? So go for, we have to first simulate the entire patch antenna for all the ports. Okay, start. So this this simulation will take will be four times. It takes more than it takes four times more than what we simulated with a single patch. Will naturally, right? Not four times. It will take two power of n times. So that is natural because we are increasing the geometry. So if you go for uh, ten element or fifty elements or hundred element plus hundred element, this simulation will be very difficult to do. This will be very tricky to do. So array factor will be very helpful for you in such case. So you get a, you design the array using the array factor and then come here for a final simulation and see whether it's matching your desired performance. 100 element per 100 elements, it's, I think it's almost impossible unless you have a very good workstation. Even with workstation, it takes a couple of days. For lower elements, like 16 elements and uh, 8 elements and all, you can do this. With this particular method of particular way of simulating the array. Do you have a class after this class? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so what time it starts exactly at 11 o'clock or 11.05? 11, 11, sir. 11, sir. 11, okay. So we will terminate the class at uh, 10.55 or 56.57 and uh, rest of the aspects will be taken in the next class before the seminar. Uh, sir, I have also. Yes, please. Your voice is not very clearly audible. Hello. Uh, sir, am I audible now, sir? It's slightly better. Uh, sir, uh, you just told me that if going for full error simulation, it takes more time, sir, because it will take the coupling effect and other effects also in the picture. And so we have to restore this normal array simulation before uh, switching to full array simulation, sir. Uh, but both are completely different because uh, uh, we don't know to how the coupling uh, it will impact precisely. So, how can we estimate from the full, from the normal array simulation about the full array simulation? 
no no uh, yes you are right so for the fuller assimilation the fuller assimilation takes a coupling into effect correct uh, normal array whatever we use using array tool will not take the full array uh, coupling into effect so we will have to go for fuller assimilation once you are going for fabrication before going for fabrication go for fuller assimilation determine the coupling at least see suppose if there are uh, it's a bigger array 64 element array or 100 element array you don't have see the coupling will be maximum only between the nearby uh, adjacent elements so you can make a smaller sub sub array and determine what is the impact of coupling and then just to know the coupling and then you can proceed with the fabrication if your coupling is significantly less alternatively if you have computational resource you have to go for the full array simulation that is the entire element has to be modeled and simulated in the uh, cst so that's what people use i think i remember one of my friend was designing 64 element array they didn't use cst they used some other tool i don't remember exactly which tool which was much faster not um, it is always a trade off right speed and accuracy is always a trade off but they were not scanning it was only broadside uh, beam so i remember the 64 element was simulated complete array was simulated along with the fit structure and to ensure that the cross polarization was uh, below a certain value so it was done so it is better to do with the full array simulation if you have the computation resource that is my opinion I don't think the simulation will complete in next two minutes, so I will avoid the simulation uh, because I don't want to disturb the next class. So we will take this particular way of simulation in the next class because I have already shown how to get this one, right? So we will take this one uh, and move forward. You don't have to do the fitting structure for the examination also. You just have to combine the results with proper phase excitations and then determine the uh, response. Okay, so if there are no other clarifications, we will terminate today's class. Uh, so uh, thank you for attending today's class. Have a good day, all of you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.